Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing a recent Supreme Court decision about property rights and government expropriation. So, Joanna, before we get to what the Supreme Court decided in this case, let's talk about what the law was up until now on when a constructive or de facto expropriation takes place and why that existing law, that existing test, wasn't enough to protect property rights. So the guiding prince uh, precedent from 2006 asked what sorry 2006 asked whether the government had taken the term is a uh, beneficial interest in the land in question and in practice the courts tended to interpret that as ownership rights which is obviously a pretty stringent test that would exclude a number of situations such as apparently this case where you have a land that is functionally unusable by the property owner but where there isn't a change in ownership so it was a very stringent and we argued unworkable test yes under the under the that test the lower courts had um, come to a different conclusion. Now, this case at the Supreme Court has sort of reformulated the test for when a de facto expropriation takes place. Malcolm, what can you tell us about what the Supreme Court held in this case? Yeah, so probably the biggest takeaway is the court clarifying what is meant by a beneficial interest. So the test in uh, the CPR case, as, as Joanna mentioned, involved two elements, what the government gets, the beneficial interest, and what's taken away from the owner, the requirement that the owner be deprived of all reasonable uses um, of the property in question. And that beneficial interest requirement was generally understood to be quite strict. Um, there were suggestions even that it amounted to, it had to amount to a property interest, which would, of course, make constructive takings basically the same thing as formal expropriation, um, because formal expropriation is when the government takes a property interest. Um, and so here the court, the court doesn't get, doesn't overturn the 2006 CPR case. It's careful to stay within the confines um, of the, the terms of that test, but it clarifies the test in a way that really opens up um, more room for claims to compensation. Specifically, they say that a beneficial interest should be interpreted broadly to mean some kind of advantage um, flowing to the government. That is much broader um, than a, uh, a property right, certainly. And indeed, when the government enacts regulations that uh, take away an owner's ability to benefit from property, it can generally be presumed that it's doing that in order to get some kind of advantage um, out of the situation, or else why would it do it? And so this really broadens the test for expropriate for, for constructive takings or de facto expropriation and puts the emphasis of the test on the effect of the government measure on the owner as opposed to what the government gets. Joanna, is there anything you want to add to that about the Supreme Court's decision and how this might benefit property owners? Yeah, well, obviously, um, it's a much more flexible approach that recognizes the many different ways that government regulation and government action can deprive an owner of their of their rights. Um, I also would add that in spite of, and I, we may talk about this later, despite the fact that property rights are not protected mm -hmm. in the charter, there was a really rich discussion about common law uh, property protections at law and that the charter is not the only source of rights. Um, and the majority in this decision drew a lot on common law property protections to arrive at their decision. Now, Malcolm, the Supreme Court actually you know, adopted some of the arguments that the CCF had made in our factum that you, the factum that you wrote, because we were an intervener in this case. So what can you tell us about what the, what the CC argued that the Supreme Court adopted? Yeah, uh, great question. I was really gratified with the result. And I think uh, we made a significant difference in this case. You can see the influence of the Canadian Constitution Foundation's factum throughout the majority decision. And I've got five points that, I, that I'd highlight. Uh, that uh, really come out of our factum and our arguments. Well, we've got First, a minute. We've got one minute, so I can you so can go be, into the into this in the, right. the next segment. But let's start with those with the be first quick. of you. I'll be quick. Yeah. So, firstly, the court clarifies there is a common law right to compensation. The com right to compensation doesn't come from the statute when the government takes property. Secondly, the court characterizes past case law in a way that essentially aligns with what we argue, that says these past cases, they're not about the government taking away a property interest, they're about the effect on owners. Thirdly, there's that beneficial interest requirement. We argued for that broad interpretation of the beneficial interest requirement and that the uh, emphasis should be on the effect on owners. 
Fourthly, there's a list of a range of examples or indicia of, of uh, constructive takings that the court adopts that essentially comes out of our factum. And finally, there's that emphasis on the importance of common law rights, the idea that Canadians' rights didn't start with the Charter in 1982. That too uh, was present in our factum, and, and I think we influenced the court on that point. All five in under a minute, why you're such a great advocate, Malcolm. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs>